And uh, so, yeah, we ended up, uh, chapter 11 is kind of where we started. And basically chapter 11 was more or less just about can we call, which is kind of a culmination of a lot of the things that we learned throughout the book so far, um, just kind of how to break things down. And it was super simple. Um, I'm not going to cover kind of a ton of the, the math in this because that's kind of like the homework that, you know, pot odds we can figure out ourselves, but going through the steps of it was pretty simple. Um, look at direct pot odds, start considering implied odds, what that may mean if they're even there. Then we figure out our own equity and then we just kind of compare between the two of them. And uh, I think we've talked about it. I think we're all more fans of the equity percentage kind of method instead of the ratio, where if you just basically have enough equity percentage, it's greater than the odds that you're being offered percentage, then you just, you call and go with it. Yep. Um, and I think it kind of breaks down pretty simply into that, even though they cover a variety of different scenarios that are both pre-flop and multi-way and post-flop and stuff like that. Um, which kind of leads a bit more into my uh, discussion questions that I was coming up with. Um, you know, these can we call decisions for me, I think they kind of get a little bit more difficult once you start going multi-way and once you start kind of like having um, unsure implied odds and such and that, and you're not entirely sure about equity, you know, sometimes you're, you're trying to range a player and thinking like, oh, they could have draws or they could be nutted or they're balanced here. And it just turns out that they're fast playing because they always fast play like their top two pair or sets or value hands. And, um, you know, they just kind of get it in. Um, so I wasn't sure uh, the can we call calculations, you know, that the book goes through and everything like that. I wasn't sure if you had any kind of questions or anything that was kind of difficult in terms of how you do these, you know, calculations or how they may apply to a hand in the middle of it. Um, just if any difficulties arrived uh, or arose in any sort of these situations that you know you wanted to discuss. Yeah, no, <clears throat> I, w I will say that this book has um, laid it out better than other books that I've read uh, on the topic. Um, Cause, uh, or, or maybe I'm just ready to understand it better, but um, you know, I've read about these topics before and it hasn't stuck, but it's finally starting to, it's finally starting to stick after reading this one. So good. Yeah. Things that are mystified seem really challenging sometimes, but um, complexity can always be reduced down into simplifications when you understand it at a high enough level, basically. Um, and I think this book does a pretty good job of it in these kind of uh, simplifications of just showing like, all right, let's just examine our odds and let's just figure out our equity and then just kind of make decisions on these equities that we have and the odds that were offered kind of decisions. And um, on some level, yeah, that's kind of like the simplification that may be all you need to continue with a lot of these things. Um, I, I added in one kind of additional question that was more discussionary. Uh, just basically, why are small river raises so frustrating in a can we call scenario? And I was wondering if you'd thought about that and had um, any answers to that. Uh, I, I think one of the reasons that it's so frustrating is because it gives us odds to call with even our weakest hands. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, we get tremendous odds. I mean, you know, imagine sometimes some of these things, you know, like, are we good like 20% of the time here? Um, it's like, well, I got a call. I got a call. I'm certainly good one out of, you know, 20% of the time, like one out of four times or something like that. And it just people don't raise the river. Um, nearly enough to justify stuff like that. So it can be really frustrating sometimes. Sometimes we run into, into these things where like pot odds and everything seem really good, but um, you know, sometimes just exploitively, like the odds aren't there, even though they seem like they should be, or it seems like, oh yeah, long-term, like I'm doing, making these calls because it'll make sense like one out of 20 times, that should be good. And sometimes that just doesn't happen. So um, especially, that seems to especially happen on the river um, where people are way more nutted it seems when they do raises yeah yeah all right so we'll move on to chapter 12 and this contained uh this is actually a pretty long chapter the next two chapters even though maybe our discussion may or may not be um chapter 12 was all out about the preflop all-ins and it covered a lot of kind of uh common common preflop spots like you know what are our odds of getting dealt, dealt aces or what are our odds of then having those aces go up against a hand like ace king um, and I don't, I couldn't find a good table for anything like that. So I didn't put that up there. 
but uh, we did have that prime dope link that I mentioned before, and I'll throw that in, um, I guess, the notes later. But that has all those odds out there if you're, people are like ever curious about that. Um, so, um, kind of moving through, you know, one of the questions I was wondering is how do you how do you personally determine some of your all in ranges? Because for me, I basically I, I went with a certain guide. Um, um, MMA sure dog is basically how I kind of play my ranges and everything like that. And I wasn't just sure if, you know, you had a methodology or anything like that. Um, when it comes to both kind of before the hand and then maybe in the hand, uh, how you kind of consider some all ins basically. For, for me, and, um, this is coming more from a live environment. Um, it depends it's, it's player dependent. Yeah. You know, um, sometimes I can get all in with pocket eights and feel good about it. And other times I'll fold pocket tens, depending on, depending on who's done the, uh, who's done the raising or re-raising. Totally. Totally. That leads kind of like what into my next point was, is yeah, sometimes we get hands that are awesome. Like they're rare, like a, like a pocket tens or like a King Jack suited, or even like an ace queen off or something like that. That seems like a, you know, it's a premium hand. It's not quite our nuts premium, but it's a premium hand for sure. And um, if the action is wrong or the player type is wrong, then, you know, we basically, that's when, you know, we can, we're making decisions that are against our range, but they're based on kind of action and position and everything like that. And the player types, um, and it's kind of painful sometimes uh, to kind of release some of those hands, but um generally i think we're of the same idea is that, that that uncertainty of trying to maybe then push that edge is just not really worth it um even if the you know even if a solver or something like that says maybe this is a spot to continue with a range uh, i think you know as good poker players we can definitely extract the fact that maybe that hand is not that good um in that circumstance or like as you said consequently maybe a pair is more valuable because a per certain person is always overplaying um, like an ASEX suited type of hand or something like that. Um, <clears throat> so the chapter moves on a little bit to talk about like implied odds, basically. And that's more about more or less about going into multi-way or if there's like other people behind left to act. Um, and, you know, <clears throat> that's something we should always be considering uh, is basically more or less, especially when there's a short stacker behind is you know, how can we either maybe, are we going to end up all in with this short stacker or maybe we can leverage kind of their position to blast out other people if they do get all in um, against, you know, and then we just play uh, a hand against that short stacker. Um, so, you know, with short stackers, uh, we want to probably raise a little bit, open raise a little bit less if they're going to be the ones potentially defending their blinds, right? But then uh, if, you know, we're attacking with three bets and stuff like that. Other players, um, we can leverage a bit more advantage and our range looks a little bit stronger. Say we're opening up a three bet against an early position raise and we're in late position and there's a short stacker blind left to act. That early position raise has to then consider, oh, well, this guy's also raising to a threshold where he may be all in against this blind. So maybe he already has a really strong hand. So there's a little bit of like fun nuance in there where we can kind of use short stackers um, against other players in our range construction. And we also just have to be, maybe they diminish our ability to open in some of these circumstances or to play back about certain things. Like um, we'll talk more about uh, sets in the next chapter, but certainly sets kind of like diminish if we're calling for set value and maybe a short stacker comes along or a short stacker is a razor that it's just not like the implied odds aren't really there. Right. And then you wind up stuck in a situation where you're, you feel like you have to call because it's just a little bit more, but you're not getting the right odds with again, pocket eights or something like that. Yeah, for sure. And that's how they, they print money. Cause then maybe a small bet on the flop too. And it's like, Oh crap, you know, I got a pair. And then by the turn, you know, they're blasting off and you've then, you know, you have to call because you're getting the right pot odds, but you've already then made, that's the third decision that you shouldn't have made. Like you shouldn't have continued pre-flop and the flop you shouldn't have continued. And then, you know, the turn uh, was certainly a mistake um, to get all in against this person, even though all along the way, you could tell a theoretical story that that was like the right thing to do. Yep. Um, 
So I just have one, I mean, one other question here. It's kind of interesting. I mean, psychologically, um, you know, something that you don't see often, but is very much like a defined play is you can see a back raise where people, you know, call or over call a uh, raise first in and then someone three bets and then someone back raises. And you can also kind of see some stuff like that through like an under the gun, the limp pre raise um, where someone, yeah, limps and then maybe cold three bets or cold four bets and stuff like that. And I think that's always really, really interesting um, in terms of kind of range dynamics when people are doing stuff like that. And it's also kind of player to player dependent. Um, certainly usually more recreational or fishy players who are like limper raising under the gun, right? Right. Um, and so I just wasn't sure if you had any thoughts on those kind of pre-flop all-in spots. It doesn't happen that often and we don't kind of uh, experience them all the time, but I, it's definitely kind of unique ranges uh, when we see when we come into those spots. Yeah, it's my uh, my particular game is really weird because the minimum buy-in is thirty three big blinds at at okay. my live uh, live setting, but the maximum buy-in is I think two hundred. Oh wow! Yeah, so you have this wide range. You'll have um yeah 200 big blind stack and someone who bought in for the minimum and then melted away to it's one three and they'll have sixty dollars <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah you yeah. know so um if they play their card rights with a premium hand i mean they could find themselves almost like five ways all in for like sixty dollars sometimes right yeah, <laughs> yeah these players aren't doing that <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah no they're 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 short stacked they're still calling with jack nine off and then folding on the flop and then you know whittling down and then you're kind of yeah you're kind of stuck in these situations where they're going all in and you have to decide is king queen good enough right now is pocket eights good enough right now king jack right I, so I, I think that's a lot of how this kind of chapter ends is talking about like equities and it's really kind of difficult to actually compute actual equities uh, against ranges in spots like that because it's just it takes a lot of time and we're not you know human calculators anyway and plus right. like what is their air tendency if it's like five percent air that changes it dramatically if it's 20 percent air like oh my gosh the amount of combinations and something like that um changes wildly so uh part of this yeah chapter concludes where he only really looks at like all in situations where it's like aces and kings or ace king or maybe they have like jack jack but um, kind of seeing these other situations where they may have just way more vastly wide ranges um, is really, really interesting. And we can only kind of figure out our equity by kind of like mucking around in some like equity calculations off the table. Um, Cause in the table, all we can do is basically hope we have some sort of logical heuristic to figure out. Yeah. Is that King Queen good here and whatnot? Um, <clears throat> it's certainly a lot different than tournament players where like once you get sub 30 BBs or 20 BBs, like everyone has their push fold charts and everyone's kind of like just almost playing completely robotically at that point too, um, yeah. in terms of push fold. So ca cash is like very interesting in that regard. Um, and how like full stacks re relate, um, to small stacks. Um, I'm going to move on, I guess, to the next one. I thought this chapter was pretty cool. Uh, chapter 13 was about sets and stealing and three bed bluffing. Um, and so, yeah, it just talks about the, um, basic, like, you know, set mining is introduction to the topic and it's just, uh, you know, it's a really, really important thing because set mining is one of the most valuable things you can do in poker, um, in terms of adding in EV, uh, especially if you're playing against like player pools where people are just like super prone to stack off when you hit the sets and everything like that. Yep. But it can also be extremely, extremely uh, painful to see how often you call preflop and then don't hit a set. And then you're just giving away maybe even like a flop float to a C bet or everything like that. Um, so the author goes into uh, some rules, basically, you know, it's more or less like seven and a half to one or eight to one to hit a set. But uh, Alton's um, consideration is that you should really kind of trying to be hoping that you're going to get 15 to one in a payback whenever you're considering calling with uh, some of these smaller pairs for set mining, um, which makes a lot of sense. It's not always easy to do, but 
um, you need to have a minimum of at least kind of like eight to one payback. Um, and it's more ideal to get 15 to one. Um, I don't think and as we get more advanced with uh, in poker and everything like that, you know, pocket pairs aren't just like sets or nothing, uh, basically. So we can kind of just start extracting more value from playing them well, right, as part of our range. Um, so that was kind of one of the questions that I'll just lead into, like what uh, value do pocket pairs have other than set mining and how could they potentially be more valuable? Um, and that's just, you know, pocket pairs by their nature are very depolarized, right? They already have some showdown value. You have a pair right from the flop. So against a person who's either not going to apply a lot of pressure and you're going to get to showdown cheaply, uh, that can be like, that can be great, right? Or if the person um, you're playing against is extremely aggressive and has a very wide range um, and may try to bluff you off stuff, that's you know a more challenging. But uh, at least you already you can always beat a bluff essentially if you have um, a pocket pair. Um, so you know we as we look into the future, it's not just set mining. We'll have these pocket pairs and we'll have to do other things with them to get back some of that investment um, that we put in because we can't just collect through. Um, just hoping to set mine, even though that is like, that is like the nature of those hands and the best way to play them. Yeah. Um, I sometimes like to be able to play them in position, uh, like literally on the button in a multi-way pot. Cause sometimes again, my live setting, lots of multi-way pots. Um, if you play it right, uh, checks through flop checks through turn, you can still throw out a bet and take it down even even if um, you're, you don't think your pocket threes are actually going to be good, you know, if the board looks straighty or, or, and, but you get the feeling that no one has interest in it, it's easy to steal with those, those small pocket pairs. Totally. That, that's one of, that's really good that you mentioned that. That is, uh, pocket pairs are tremendously good for kind of doing those plays or like turning them into some sort of polarization later on because right. they don't really block any of the board that you're hoping other people fold. Like no one else is, you know, you're not trying to fold out like three, two when you have threes. Like that's just not even a big part of it. Um, and then, you know, it just kind of like meshes in well and disguises a bit of your range that you're not always like semi-bluffing or bluffing or not always betting with it. You could just have like these other small combinations um, that could then if they hit are their super disguised. Like if you turn a two out to yep. this set, that's amazing. Um, yep. And plus, yeah, I mean, you know, just denying other people their equity share because um, it's always over cards to, you know, a small pocket pair. Right. So they're always live. So denying that equity on the turn when no one's shown interest is, you know, that's how you, that's how you gain more value with the pocket pairs um, and not just set mine. So yeah, that's in incredibly important. Um, yeah. To do stuff plan like a is set mine, but, but plan B uh, you can work in some other, some other plan beads there. <clears throat> Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just a give out. It's not like an oh shucks. I didn't hit it's, you know, all right. I still have viability. Uh, if the board looks like, you know, or the situation kind of calls for it. So he moves into uh, just talking about pre-flop a little bit in stealing. And um, <clears throat> he just talks a lot about blind stealing from late position. And he talks about how powerful the button is because we get to open up and steal a lot more um, from that position. And um, he, go, he starts to go into some math of opens between min raises and two and a half BBs and three BBs and kind of you know, what that may look like in terms of how often people need to defend and how often steals need to be successful. But the general gist of it is if you're trying to steal, you need to be successful about like two thirds of the time um, is kind of what the, the pot odds math breaks out to be, whether you're opening up min rays or three BBs. Um, in the long term, it comes out to be about, you know, two thirds of the time. Um, but each one of those sizes then has kind of different post-flop considerations, right? If you're opening up larger, their range is going to be tighter. Uh, so when you go post-flop, you know, you're already playing against a condensed range. So you have to be a little bit more careful where if you open up to a min raise, their range is going to be wider. So it's going to be weaker post-flop. So maybe they hit a little bit more, but you can still apply a little bit more pressure. Um, I personally generally open about 2.2 bbs to 2.4 bbs in late position i think that's like a little bit better than just offering min raise odds 
and um, it, you know, you still want to build the pot too. Like you're in position with, you know, the initiative. So it feels good to like, you know, put a little bit more money in because you're assuming that you're going to win that money back later on. Right. Yeah. Um, so I wasn't sure if you had any uh, thoughts about um, when you're trying to steal that may involve either like the kind of the direct considerations you're getting pre-flop, whether that may be like opponent's tendencies or any sort of HUD numbers, and then also kind of like some post-flop uh, considerations as well. Uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm definitely paying attention to HUD numbers. Um, if, uh, if they're calling wide, um, I will... I will fold things from the button like 10.5. It's just 10.5 oh, yeah. suited, um, even though that should be within our range. If they're calling too much, that 10.5 is not going to have very much value. Uh, but that being said, I do find that the 2.5x raise size is great because, uh, at least at my stakes, folks are not defending appropriately once they hit the flop. So um, that 2.5x gives them the incentive to call um with weaker hands and then wind up folding on the flop so you actually get a little bit more money than Heck yeah just stealing the blinds yeah which should i mean one out but you know whatever how often it actually happens like one out of six orbits you have the button and everything like that which may be an open chance to steal so that extra half a bb or whatever like that eventually like in the thousands of hands of poker that you play turns out to be a significant chunk of actual additional money um that yep. you make so um we have to start optimizing and thinking about stuff like that. And like, it's really good that you're on that path. Cause yeah, it, it's super important. And you know, that two and a half is like, that is that sweet spot where the range is not too wide and maybe they have like weird two pairs that they're going to continue with. And it's not too tight that, you know, you have to be worried about putting an aggression and really condensing the range into something strong too. Um, so <clears throat> Uh, he goes into three bets after talking about stealing. And basically the idea of three bets is kind of pretty straightforward on some level, even though it's not at all. Uh, you can either three bet linearly, like kind of top down a condensed range, like all value, or you can three bet polarized, um, which is, you know, a lot of premium and then like a lot of suited connectors or like, you know, nut flush draws kind of stuff to go with that. Um, so part of that is you know, villain dependent. Um, maybe we want to put more linear stuff in or polar stuff against people who potentially overfold or overhaul. Uh, there's yep. definitely always kind of considerations along those lines. And then kind of uh, part of it is actually positional too. Like I've been told, and I don't know, I forget the actual reasoning why, but I only kind of three bet uh, depolarized from the small blind. And I, and I three bet way more polarized and for a larger size from the big blind. Um, you know, the big blind, that means I'm going to be the last one to act. And I can just, if any three bet there is definitely kind of just way more polar, polar by nature, given that like I'm the last to act and I'm saying I have the best hand. So, um, why not push my top end and then kind of put some other bluffs in there too, where if I'm three betting from the small blind, I'm more about testing out, well, Hey, you're late position. And I'm saying I have a better range than you that's depolarized. So I'll, I'll take that advantage potentially going into the flop out of position kind of stuff like that um yeah that's that's the thing on um uh small blind has one person to act behind them um so uh you have that but what the big blind also has is just the ability to close action um and uh so when they are re-raising instead of closing action they can signal a stronger hand whereas the small blind by them just calling they, they don't have that option to just close action they've got the big blind behind them that can then do a squeeze or um like that's definitely why you have to go linear from the uh from the small blind um yeah. and uh yeah and then um but uh again it's all because that big blind has that option to just um to just close action and call that they get more of a they can they're allowed to have more of a polarized range it's fun how poker kind of reduces into like uh almost like logical things in a sense or like logical kind of math issues like you know if you're last to act well then you have kind of like this right to do this move that other people don't really have you know you're either going to say like these are the stakes we're going to play at or we're going to play at higher stakes or whatever and it's kind of based on your determination and that's just kind of like a just a logical 
uh, inference or breakdown of kind of like what can happen in the in the spot. So it's, it's really cool how like uh, a little piece of logic can then turn into range construction um, yep. for those yep. things. <clears throat> so he doesn't go a lot into three bet bluffing um, in the little kind of math that he does uh, then kind of breaks down into um, it's math we're doing all along, but essentially a lot of three bet bluffs need to work about two thirds of the time. Um, and for the most part, that kind of just goes down to the risk reward ratio that we've been looking at throughout the book. Um, oftentimes you're risking about nine BBs um, and you're kind of already getting, um, turns out to be like a two to one or like three to one kind of in there that <clears throat> is kind of the math. And you're just kind of looking at, you know, needing to have your three bet bluffs work about two thirds of the time. Um, and he still doesn't really advocate for a strong kind of just go with it bluff range. Uh, he's definitely wants you to consider more uh, linear polar, but um, the application of fold equity is highly encouraged uh, pre-flop just because it removes the ability to the pot get raked um, is one of the main things is right. you get uh, the chance to win that before the pot is raked. So there's a huge incentive that shifts the uh, kind of pot odds um, to win preflop before the pot is raked um, when you are bluffing or semi-bluffing preflop. Um, so that kind of concluded all of the preflop stuff. And then he moves on into, this is now the next section of the book. It starts to talk about post-flop stuff. Um, and he goes into just value betting. Chapter 14 is betting with the best of it. And um, you know, to figure out how to bet with the best of it, his kind of metric is examine the board. Is it wet or dry? And so wet boards, you know, we're more worried about. Obviously, the nature of them, our opponent may be a little bit made more already or may have more draws. And dry boards are generally like if we're already ahead, our equity on the flop is for the most part going to kind of be close to what the equity is on the river. Um, it's not going to be super dynamic. Um, so that is his kind of uh, metric for checking out how to bet with the best of it is, is the board super wet or super dry um, off the top of it and how that relates to being the PFR, like our equity and potential nuts advantage. Um, and I had a question here, uh, you know, I wasn't sure if you know, but what board type is bet the least by solvers? Um, and I think you know this from Fish in a Barrel. Yeah, those uh, those middling uh, uh, straight completing boards, like six, seven, eight, uh, uh, two suited, something yeah. like that is just the, the, horrible. It, yeah, definitely. Yeah, because you know it's really tough to have any sort of nut advantage on something like that. Um, like a monotone flop, there's no flush advantage. There's no anything like that where the opponent. Um, can have all the nuts and we don't clearly hold any of the nuts. Um, we just have to be more, way more um, conscious that uh, what we're doing there without the nut advantage, um, we just have to, you know, slow down a little bit and bet a little bit less. Um, <clears throat> so um, he goes into a lot and we talked about this a bit more, but when the board is uh, dynamic, um, just kind of punishing and betting sizes that really punish what you assume your opponent to be on, whether it's on a draw or not. Um, Alton is very much uh, of the idea that, you know, what we talk about in GTO of only having maybe like one range bet size or like considerations. He, he thinks very much that if you can range your opponent to be on a draw and you can beat that draw, you should be betting larger to just give them bad pot odds and bet large to continue to do that to punish them as much as often because right there you're printing ev if they're calling bad with direct odds that is technically like ev in your pocket um the consideration though that then becomes very difficult is if you've given them bad odds twice and then like their river card that you don't want to see rolls off you know the only way to counteract um counteract basically them getting there is to not pay them off with implied odds, which becomes a huge psychological thing of like, oh crap, we're on the river and I've already invested a lot of money. Right. Um, but it is almost imperative uh, 
you know, he's trying to make the case that it is your, if you pay them off in the implied odds at the end of it, you know, they made the correct call on the flop and turn. Even if you gave them bad direct, direct odds by paying them off, even if it, you know, felt good or whatever, for whatever reason, you made that call on the river when they got there. That is your mistake. Even if you played the other two streets perfectly by giving them bad odds. Yeah. Um, I think that's super important to kind of realize um, is that, yeah, when you condense ranges down into draws like that, and then the draw gets there to not pay off because that is how you undo all that EV gain that you got by betting larger. Um, <clears throat> so even to that point, uh, Alton says, you know, we can overbet the flop if you really want to, which doesn't really happen. But, you know, if you want to just kind of punish odds and make them very much less appealing, uh, he says overbet the flop. It's not even like a big deal. Um, and, and I thought that was kind of interesting and surprising um, for essentially like a small stakes book um, in advice. But I thought that was really cool. I think overbets are super powerful. And to um, say, you know, an overbet is the best way to get the value when you're ahead and to give bad odds to your opponent, um, just go ahead and overbet, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, I wasn't sure if you ever use overbets on the flop or anything like that. And not really on the flop. And, and it's something, it's one thing that, um, I, I disagree with from the, uh, from the book. It's like the one, the only thing so far that I, I have a strong disagreement with. Um, I don't think we're ever going to know that someone is on a 15 out draw. And once again, even if they are, um, our, our equity isn't that great. I mean, unless maybe we have it set. Um, so I, I don't know that the, I mean, he's, he says they're going to overbet. Uh, and if they have the 15 out draw, they're probably going to shove anyway. Um, so it's kind of, um, I, I don't know how wise that is to try and induce a shove when you're likely barely ahead. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. Well, <laughs> on some level, like, Hey, we want to, you know, if, yeah. If it's like a 50, 50 thing, maybe, and we're getting it in, we want to, if we get it in, uh, that's fine. But yeah, if we just bet small and they come over huge over the top with their draw maybe we right. have to fold out equity or if like maybe we bet too big and then we commit ourselves with like a lesser hand and they have the better equity of it that's also like a huge issue as well too right um i personally don't really overbet the flop at well i i i can't say that's totally true but i generally overbet the flop i look for these spots when it's a three bet or four bet flop and i have a hand like ace king mm -hmm. And I could be drawing to on like a queen 10 X board or something like that, where I can put on a lot of pressure to be what I presume their lower pairs that may be ahead of me while also having like draw equity and draws to top pair, top kicker and stuff like that. Um, so other than kind of looking at like extreme polarization strategies on the flop and single raise pots, um, I generally don't really overbet because I think it kind of goes against a lot of range considerations and disguising yep. and stuff like that. And I think, um, you know, I think there's a lot of skill to be had on the turn and river instead of just going into this, like this hyper polarized thing on the flop where you end up just playing small ranges against small ranges where right. neither right. person may have like a clear advantage kind of thing like that. Once you start going so large, um, so I thought it was cool that he mentioned that, but also, yeah, in terms of, you know, kind of micro SSNL, like I don't, I don't know how super valuable that is to implement other than just being aware that, you know, no one in poker says you have to bet pot or less. It could always be more um, if you want, if you feel the circumstance calls for it. It's, it's honestly, it's something I'm, I'm continually thinking about live poker because I'm hoping to be back there in a couple of weeks. But at my tables, that overbet is probably going to get called, even without the 15-hour draw. Um, so it's not something that I have tried before, but it's might so, it might be something that I start trying out um, at uh, at my at my live game because I I think it's going to work. I think it's going to get called bad. Yeah, yeah, that's the thing. Exactly. Like you know, if people have to say over defend on like a king seven three and they're out of position with king x, they're going to call every overbet with top pair weak kicker no matter what. And that's the circumstance yeah. where you have aces or like a, you know just a better king and stuff like that. 
you know, no matter what, um, even if the solver says to fold or they don't need to defend all their top pair kings, people are absolutely not folding top pair to an overbet. So you get more money in quickly while your hand's good and you get, you know, you're reduced to stack to pot ratio so you can make more money off them later. Um, and, you know, that all feels really good as opposed to just going like a third and then like, oh crap, you know, I, how do I get more value on the turn? <laughs> and you have to start betting bigger later and everything like that. Um, so yeah, I think live poker could be really great for that through the lens of like, how do I get a lot of value? Um, yep. yeah. Where, where do you live? What part of the country? Uh, Virginia. Oh, what is, uh, uh, the Harbor do you go up to like in DC? Yeah. Or? Okay. Basically DC. Yeah. I'm, I'm just South of DC. So, okay. Yeah. I've heard those casinos are great. I've heard they're like a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. 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 I'm going to have to give that a try at some point. Um, so I'm going to move on to just the last chapter that we're going to get to in this meeting, which is chapter 15 and it's semi bluffing. Um, and kind of, he talks a lot of stuff about semi bluffing that is just kind of basic stuff that we kind of, kind of learn as poker players is that, you know, flush draws have like nine outs and, um, you know, straight draws have eight outs and it's better to apply, um, semi-bluff equity kind of with these hands because we can draw and then we essentially have like fold equity as well. Um, so his main, you know, how you define a semi-bluff is it just has odds to draw out to a better hand where pure bluffs are just like totally just wild hands um, that you don't really expect. And they're outside of kind of the range that the turn and river may improve. Um, semi-bluffs are really sweet because they maximize fold equity right away, right? If you're all in on the flop, you know, that's kind of really scary for someone to face is an all in unless they're already super made or drawing themselves and they get max value too, which is really nice. Should you hit your flush draw? Um, you know, the opponent has no chance of then check folding and saving money because all the money, the hundred BBs are already in the middle and you scoop all of it. Um, yeah. So semi-bluffing is awesome. I mean, it is really, really cool because we get to apply pressure and, you know, even if we're wrong, we have outs to draw back on and everything like that. And we can make um, really big pots along the way. So I wasn't sure if you just had any semi-bluffing preferences, things you like to go with, positions, anything like that. Any, any kind of things when you think about semi-bluffing, you think like, oh yeah, you know, that's how I semi-bluff. Um, reading this chapter was good for me because um, it uh, it helped break some of my feelings. Like I feel my semi bluffs don't work. I'll shove with the um, you know uh, nut flush draw, and then I don't get there. Yeah. Um, right. But but like this is kind of saying that um, if you do it often enough, um, when you do get there, you're you're getting paid. Oh, for sure. Yeah, uh, the the odds work out. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Think about you know, just think about casino empires built on like a one percent edge in like you know blackjack yep. or like giving back like ninety nine percent in slots kind of stuff like that. If we can find these semi bluffing things where you know we're already have like near fifty percent equity and then we can just push a little bit of fold equity onto stuff like that. Yeah. Oh my gosh, we are we're not going to win every time for sure. Like, you know, that naked nut flush draw may have 12 outs and you know that's super close and everything like that. Um, but you know, if we routinely get that in, they're going to they're going to fold more and we're going to hit more often that we can build our own empire kind of through semi bluffs. Yep. And of course, what's the other thing about it? It gives us balance to um the rest of the range, right? So we, we can have definitely sets and we do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah, so we can just crush it kind of um at the end. So that's how we gain kind of like max fold equity and max value um, for a lot of part of our ranges and for those like uh, specific semi bluff type hands. Um, and that was kind of uh role. That's kind of like where I got to with this uh, week's book club. Um, you know, I didn't, I haven't really covered a lot of math examples. I thought the book was good for that. And that's yeah. kind of just like, I didn't want to rehash just like adding and subtracting and dividing and everything like that. I was just trying to make it more kind of um, how we implement some of these maths into more like discussion spots or how like actually math can apply to us in poker when we're dealing with ranges and positions and other player types. So um, that's kind of just what I had. I wasn't sure if you had any other questions uh, through these chapters or anything you'd like to discuss. Yeah, no, not so far. I mean, I think I discussed everything that that came to mind for sure. So awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, are you done now at this point or, or with the book or uh, you're about where I was? Cause 
Um, I wasn't sure like next for the next week, we'll certainly finish the remaining. Uh, I think it turns out to be like three chapters of content basically. Yeah. Not done yet. Uh, I am a little bit further. Uh, I just started um, the final section, what EV and um, I can't remember the title of it, but yeah, I, I just started the, 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 you know, the final um yeah, just the final section. Yeah, EV, uh, EV calculations and combinatorics is what That's it goes it. into. Yeah, yeah. Cool. <clears throat> I, I barely started it. I got like uh, one page in. So. All right. Awesome. Yeah, we do a little bit of bluffs and then EV and then combinatorics for the next one. And um, we'll just kind of wrap it up with that. So yeah. thanks for being here. I appreciate it. Yep. No problem. <laughs> and uh, cool. I'll see, you, uh, I'll see you in the Slack group. Yep. Sure thing. All right. Cool. All right. Yep. Enjoy. Thank you.